I am so thankful for the opportunity to be here. And I, I, I do, I will tell you, I don't usually sound like a, like a chain smoker normal, most of the time, so I apologize. Uh, I've, I've been under the weather a little bit the last couple of days, and so today it decided to manifest itself in no voice, and so I apologize for that. But the Lord knows, and the Lord is, is still here with us, and so praying that he'll, he'll use me. And really, it's not all about me. It's all about him. But I'm praying that he'll use me and, and the, the limited ability that I have to, to proclaim him, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I'd like, first of all, to, uh, to uh, thank you for allowing us to be here, and thank you, Pastor. I appreciate the opportunity. I'd like to introduce my wife, Danielle, if you'd please stand up. This is my wife, Danielle, and uh, so thankful to have my family traveling with me. We have two daughters as well there in the nursery. Jaina's two years old, and Alexis is three months old. And so, hope, so if you stick around a little while to the service, you'll get to meet them, and they're, they're a blessing. And I'm so thankful to be able to, to do the Lord's work with my family, and so glad to be here with y'all today. I'd like to say just a, just a couple of things about our, our ministry before I, I, I launch into the Word of God this morning. And so you, you saw the video, and uh, the, the, the sound that you heard there at the very beginning of that video, that is the Muslim call to prayer. And so, and so that, that, that sound is what we'll be hearing every morning that, that we're there in Indonesia. And it starts about 4, 4.30, 5 in the morning at sunrise. We'll hear that sound first thing in the morning and then four other times throughout the day as the Muslim people do their, do their ritual that they do every day. They get up and they, they bow down and they repeat the rote words that they've memorized as they pray to a God that does not hear them. And, 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 and as they do this process, that they think that one day they will find favor with their God. And, 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 and really, those words that they, that they say, those words that they quote, they're, they're, they're meaningless. They, they have no value because the one that they're praying to is, is, is not a true God, but a false God. And so we're excited about going to the nation of Indonesia. As you saw in the video, the largest Muslim country in the world there are more Muslims there than any other place you could go in the Middle East, in Africa, any other Muslim country. There are more there than anywhere else. But we want to praise the Lord that God is working and that God is able to save souls just as easily in Connecticut as he is to save souls there in Indonesia. And that God is working on hearts and God does save Muslims. It's a little bit of a challenge. It's a little bit different the way you approach a Muslim person. But the power of God is just the same and God is just as capable of saving those folks there in Indonesia as he is of saving us as well. And so we're, we're excited about us. Don't feel sorry for us. We're looking forward to it. We, we know that God is going with us and that we are going because God has called us there. Uh, we will be going to a city, uh, ultimately the city of Jogjakarta, where there are, there are dozens of universities there. And so God has put us, put it on our hearts to start a church there and to reach out. And we want to have a ministry to the university students there. Dozens of universities there in that city and the people of Indo the young people of Indonesia come from all over, from different islands, different villages and towns, to this city to train for whatever, whatever they plan on doing with their lives. And so we pray that as they come there to Jogjakarta, they won't just get an education, but we're praying that they'll be able to come to know Christ as their Savior. And we want to see them go back to wherever they're from, whatever island, whatever city that they come from, and to take the gospel with them. And we are praying about that, and we are excited about that. Um, I I'd, I'd like to... Um, I'd like to just uh, have a few uh, prayer requests that you would think of as you think about us. And uh, please pray that, as, of course, as we travel around, that we'll have safety in traveling. And we're, these next few weeks, we're going to be all over New England going to different places. So please pray for us. Uh, but also pray for the Muslim people. Uh, pray, of course, pray, pray for the people in Indonesia as we prepare to go there. But also pray for the Muslim people that are here in this area. Um, a, 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 a survey that was done almost 10 years ago in 2010, estimated there are approximately thir over 13,000 Muslims are not accurate anymore. And, and, and in all the research I've done, though, the, the numbers of all the, the Muslims in America have at least doubled in every place. And so, uh, and so there could be as many as 25,000 Muslim people here in this state. And in fact, my wife and I were at Walmart yesterday over, over in uh, over in Newington, and we saw two Muslim ladies there shopping at Walmart. And so please pray for Muslim people, but also you have an opportunity to reach out to them and show them the love of Christ and to, and, and to have them into your home for a meal. And so pray for them, 
but also you have a great opportunity to minister to them here, here in Connecticut. You don't have to leave this country to go and to find people who don't know the Lord. And so I want to challenge you with that, but pray for Muslim people, pray for us uh, as we travel, and then pray that we, while we're on deputation, will have an opportunity to meet some Muslim folks and to be able to, to speak to them and to share the gospel with them while, we're, while we are, are here. And so I've, I've, I've discovered a few things in my, in my studies and in my meeting of, of, of Muslim people and, and being to Indonesia for a few weeks. Muslim people like to travel, or Indonesian people like to travel. Indonesian people like, you know, they, they like to go places, that, you know, and, and they love to talk to people. They love to meet new people, uh, you know, talk about where you're from, and so it's a great opportunity to, to reach out to them, and so we're excited about it. And so I, I love to talk about Indonesia, and honestly, I could, t I could stand up here all morning and talk about Indonesia and about different things about it, and I'd love, if you have any questions, please come to us and ask us. I'd love to t talk more with you, but there, there's, there's really, there, there are a few things that I love more than talking about Indonesia. And one of those is opening up the Word of God and proclaiming God's Word. And so I'm excited about doing that this morning. And so if you would please open your Bibles with me to John chapter 4 and verse 35. And we're going to start here in John 4. And we're going to see here a, a, a verse, a passage that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke that is used oftentimes when we think about missions and we think about the need of the lost. And we're going to, we're going to look at this verse and we're going to look a little bit broader at the context of how this came about and what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples here as he spoke these words to them. But let's, if you're there in John chapter 4 and verse 35, follow along as I read this verse here, John 4, 35. The Bible says, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Again, he said unto his disciples, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. And of course, we know that the Lord is saying that, that as the people look around, see the people around. They are ready. The harvest is ready to bring in. The people that we see, the souls that we see, they are in need. They need something. They, 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 they are lost. Not, you know, they don't even realize that they're without Christ. Some of them don't even realize their need, but they realize that they're missing something in life. They realize that, that life is hard and life is difficult. And, and they realize that, that, that if things continue the way that they are, hey, they are going to die one day. And, 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 and that startling fear to, to, to realize that they don't know where they're going to be. And they are in need. And the Lord is imploring his, his, his disciples here to look up and to pay attention to realize that there are people around that are going to spend eternity somewhere, and that harvest is ready. And so I, we're going to look back in, in time, and we're going to go back after we pray here in a second. We're going to go back to the beginning of John chapter 4, and we're going to briefly go through this story here, and we're going to see what transpired that brought Jesus to make this profound statement about the fields that are white and ready to be harvested. Let's bow our heads and pray, and then we'll go here and look at, at John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1 here. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for today and for your blessings, Father. I thank you for the opportunity that I have to be here at Meriden Hills Baptist Church, and I thank you for this church and for the pastor and the other workers here in this church who are laboring here and who are proclaiming your word in Connecticut, Father. I thank you, Lord, that I'm able to be here and speak. I thank you for your word and how it instructs us and teaches us. I pray that you'd help me today, Lord, that you would use my voice as, as, uh, as unreliable as it is, that I could proclaim your word clearly, Father. I pray that even though my voice may not sound out, I pray that your truth would from your word, Father. I pray that you take this message that you've shown to me, help me to proclaim it, Father, that it could be a blessing to the hearts of the people. I pray, Father, uh, with the pastor, that, you would, that your spirit would be upon people, that they'd allow you to work and to move in their hearts, Father. I pray that you'd help me to be a vessel that can, that can be, uh, proclaim your word clearly, Father. I love you. Thank you for loving us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, if, as we go back to John chapter 4 and verse 1, we are going to be in a familiar story, uh, possibly, that, you, that you've heard of. Now, we, we, would, we would title this story here that it transpires in John chapter 4. We would, we would, talk, we would describe it as the woman at the well. This is the events that led up to Jesus making this profound statement about the fields that are white and ready to be harvested. And Jesus here encountered this woman at the well. 
And I want us to look at this encounter. I want us to see some of these things that went on and about the burden that was in Jesus Christ's heart that Jesus was trying to impart on his disciples. And we got to hear it, to hear in, in, in our, in our uh, life group this morning with the men about how that Jesus Christ was working with those disciples and trying to teach them and trying to, to help them to understand some things. And I'd like us to see one of these things, the most important thing that Jesus was trying to impress on their heart, the need for the lost. Let's look in, in John chapter 4 and verse 1. A couple of intro verses here and then we'll get right into it. Verse 1 says, when therefore the Lord knew the, how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. We see here that Jesus Christ, who was really the greatest missionary of all time, he was sent from heaven. He came down to this earth with a message to proclaim. He was the sacrifice, and he came to, 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 to draw all men unto himself and to say that there is no, salvation in no other but through himself, through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ lived out the ministry of a missionary while he was here on this earth. Now, normally when we think about missionaries, okay, a lot of times we think about someone who's going overseas, who, who's traveling a long way away to go to a people that speaks a different language, to, 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 to go to a people that are different than themselves and to share the gospel with them. And while that definitely is true, I'd say that's a very limited view of what a missionary is. Really, a missionary is someone who is sent out. That's what the word means. Someone who is sent out on a mission with a task to perform. And that mission that we've been given by Christ is to share the gospel with every creature. We see that in the Great Commission at the end of all four of the gospels. And that's the mission that Jesus Christ has given to us, the same mission that he had on this earth. And Jesus Christ displayed that very clearly as a missionary. He went to the lost sheep of Israel. He went to his people. But he also had opportunities to go out a little ways outside of his comfort zone, which is what we normally think of what a missionary would do. And we see here that Jesus Christ went on a mission trip to Samaria. And I want us to look at this mission trip to Samaria. We see there in verse 4 that Jesus Christ... We see this in verse 4, it says, And he must needs go through Samaria. We see that this trip that Jesus went on was an important trip. It wasn't an accident that Jesus ended up in Samaria. It wasn't just happenstance that Jesus and his disciples came to this particular city and this particular part of the nation of Israel. Now, the, the Samaritans were not well liked by, by, by the nation of Israel. The people did not like the Samaritans because of their history, because of something that had happened in the past. But there was a great dislike between these two people. The Jews hated the Samaritans, and in turn, the Samaritans did not like the Jews very much either. But we see that something was burning in the Lord Jesus Christ within his heart that he said, I must needs go to this place. We see, first of all, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was in the right place. He was in the right place. Now, it just so happened that normally when an, Isra an Israeli man would travel from the south, uh, the southern part of Israel where Jesus was, up to the north, Normally, they would not take this route that Jesus took. Although it's right, in the, in the, in, in, right along the road that you would travel the most direct route, most Israelites would travel around Samaria. They would go the long way around to avoid being in this place that Jesus said he must needs go. But we see that Jesus ended up right here in this place. It was not a place where Jews were well accepted. It was not a place where normally he would, he, he would be. I'm sure the disciples, when Jesus told them where they were going, they probably said, Jesus, are you sure about that? Jesus, is that a good idea? You know, that's uncomfortable to us. That's typical. I don't think that's where we ought to go. But we see that it was the right place because there was someone there who needed to hear the gospel. Because Jesus was going to encounter a woman there at the well who needed something more than water, as we'll see. Jesus was in the right place. But we all see that Jesus was there at the right time. As we continue reading in verse 5, it says, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now, now the Jewish day counted, as they counted the hours, they would start, the first hour started at 6 o'clock. And so by the time we get from 6 o'clock to the sixth hour, 
It would have been about noontime. It would have been hot. It would have been sunny over there in the Middle East. And we see that Jesus found himself sitting at this well. The disciples, if we find out later on, had gone into the city to get food. And so Jesus was sitting here at the well. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He was sitting in the hot sun. He would have been very uncomfortable because Jesus was a man. Although he was 100% God, he was 100% man. He dealt with all the things that we do. He felt that thirst. He felt that hunger. He felt the rays of the sun beating down upon him. But he, we, re, we see here that he was there not only at the right place, but he was there at the right time. This is not a time when anyone else would have been out at the well. It was unusual. Why, why would he be sitting here at the well? It didn't make sense. And, and, and the disciples probably invited him, Jesus, come into the city with us. You know, you, know, you can stand in the shade a while. You can come and go ahead and get some, you know, you know, we can get some water from somewhere in the city. We can get some food and refreshment there. But Jesus said, go on ahead. I'm going to stay here. We see that he was not only at the right place, but he was also at the right time. Because Jesus was going to meet the right person. The right person. I'm going to go ahead and tell you now, there is no wrong person. There is no one here on this earth who is not eligible for salvation. There is no one that we can think of, that we can imagine, who has done so much against God, or who is, or who is not worthy, or who, or, or who is too much of a sinner to, to be able to come to know Christ as their personal Savior. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter where they live. We're going to the Muslim people of Indonesia. Most people in America have no love for Muslim people because of things that have happened in the past, because of, because of the hatred of many of the Muslim people. But Jesus Christ died to save them, and they are the right people just so much as our loved ones that we pray for, that they'll come to know Jesus Christ, and there's no wrong person. We see that this woman who came, came at a time when no one else was there. Later on, we will find out that, that, that she was not a well-respected woman in the community. She, she had had multiple husbands, and, and, and she was living with a man now who was not her husband. And she was not well-respected in the community. But Jesus Christ came to this city. He was in the right place at the right time so we could meet this one woman here at the well so that he could take the time to spend with her and to share the gospel with this woman. And this is why Jesus was here. It was an important trip. We'll see, we'll see there was an involved testimony. We're not going to go into the details of this for time's sake. But Jesus, as he spoke with this woman, came to some, to some difficulties, some obstacles. He encountered cultural barriers. They thought differently. He encountered spiritual ignorance. She did not understand the spiritual words that Jesus was using. He was talking about living water, that he, he would never thirst again, and she had no clue what he was talking about. We know now, we understand clearly what he was saying, but she had no idea. We see some moral obstacles. There were some issues in this woman li woman's life that she had, to, she had to realize were wrong. She had to realize that she needed Christ as her Savior. And then we finally see conflicting beliefs. And through all of this long conversation, we're not going to take the time to go through it. Please do read it after, uh, later on in verses 7 through 26. But Jesus went through this long conversation to bring her to, to, to make this one statement. It all was for this one statement that Jesus Christ made. And it is here in verse uh, I'll read verse 25 of, of John 4. It says, The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Amen. And he went through this involved testimony, this long process, this long conversation, and at every chance he steered the conversation back so we could bring to this one point that he was the Messiah that he was the one who had come to take away the sins of all the entire world. And sometimes in our soul-winning efforts as we reach out, sometimes it takes some effort. Sometimes it takes some work. As we go to the Muslim people in Indonesia, it's a long process. We're not, we're not allowed to knock on doors and, 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 and hand out tracts. But even if we were, we would not have a good reception. We would not see people come to know Christ and bow their heads and pray there at the door. We would not see people coming into the doors of our church and coming down and accepting Christ as their Savior the first time they hear it. That's unusual. It could happen, and God can do it, but it's going to take some time and some work and some effort. And many times, that's what it takes for our friends and loved ones. It's going to take some involved testimony. We're going to have to take some time and work with them and pray for them and share the gospel with them. And we see that Jesus took that time because he loved this woman, and he cared about her and her soul. We see there was an important trip an involved testimony. And then finally, we, we, we make it to this verse that we read here in verse 36. We see an invitation to toil. 
an invitation to toil. And Jesus Christ was making this invitation to his disciples, but he makes it to all of us as well. After these events that we read about took place, this woman accepted Christ as her Savior, and she goes back into the city. She left, she returned to the city different than when she left. She went back a different way than she came. She was not that same woman that came out with that water pot to the well. She was new. She was changed because of this experience she'd have with the Lord Jesus Christ. And she, just like many of us when we were first saved, she wanted everyone that she knew to know about this man, Jesus. And she went into the city and she told everyone she could find, come out and see this man who told me everything that ever I did. She, she was telling them that truly this man is the Messiah. This is the one who we had heard about. And, 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 and this woman, she wasn't even fully Jewish. She didn't even understand all of the, the, what that meant. But she went and, and, and she called those people. Now, I'm, now, as this is happening, the disciples start to make their way out of the city. They've got the food, whatever it is, bread. Maybe, you know, you know they're, they're fishermen. They like fish. Maybe they've got some fish. Okay. They're coming out with this food. And I'm sure they're looking around. What, what is going on? Who are all these people? What, what is, why is everybody going out in the middle of the day out here to this well? This is really unusual. And as they come here and as they, they come to Jesus, they offer him the food and say, here, Jesus, here's the food. And Jesus makes an interesting statement to them in, in verse, verse 2. He says, But he saith unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. He basically says, I, you know, I don't really need that food because I have something more important than food. I, I have something that's more satisfying than food. I have something that's far more valuable and far more useful than food. They're confused and in verse 33, therefore saith the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Did, did someone else bring him food? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. Now I find it interesting here that Jesus uses an analogy that is a physical analogy. Jesus uses this, this parable, as it were, this, this analogy of the harvest. It's an agricultural, agricultural culture there, and, and they, 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 to get by, they, many people were farmers, and they would, they would plant fields, and they would grow crops and harvest them. This was very well understood by the, by the disciples. They would have known exactly what was going on. But we see that Jesus had to, to, to tell a physical story. He had to talk about something that was physical, because we see that Jesus wanted to give a spiritual truth to his disciples. But we see that the disciples were so focused on the physical that they totally missed the spiritual. They were so focused on their physical need of food and water that they were totally oblivious to the spiritual need of the people there in that city of Samaria. And the Lord Jesus Christ here is trying to get this idea to his disciples, this exact same idea that I would like to get across to you today. Rather than being so caught up and so worried about the here and now, so worried about the needs that I have, about my wants, about my desires, about what I can do, about what I can gain. Now, granted, it's important to take care of your family. It's important to have a job and work and make money. It's important to have food and provide for your family. Absolutely. But if we get so caught up with the physical things, if our mind is so centered about us and about what we need to do here on this earth, we miss out on a great opportunity. And Jesus Christ is trying to redirect his disciples' eyes. He's saying, look up on the harvest. Look and see. It's white. It's ready to be harvested. I'm sure at first they were like, what? There are no fields around here. Lord, it's not, it's not harvest time. What in the world are you talking about? But then as they thought about the light began to dawn, and they, and, and, they, and, and they saw those people who would come, those people who would gather around to hear Jesus, and they realized, it's not all about me. It's not all about what I can do. It's not about what I can accomplish. It's not about what I can gain. But Jesus was trying to teach his disciples the most important lesson. Hey, that while it's going to take some work, it's going to be a toil, just like that, just like that farmer has to put in the work to, to sow the seed and to water and to harvest. Hey, in the same way, God is inviting us to work and to not just to work in the physical, but to work in the, in, in, for the spiritual need. And Jesus Christ wanted to get his disciples' eyes off of themselves and off of the physical needs. And he wanted them to look up 
They were, they were looking down. They were looking at their food. They were looking at themselves. They were looking at this need. The first words that Jesus said during this book, in the, the words that Jesus says, he says, lift up your eyes. This morning, I would like to, to challenge you to lift up your eyes. Look around you. It's so easy to get in the car, kind of put, it, you know, put yourself in autopilot mode, go where you're going, get it done. That's how we think in America. Do what you need to do, get it done, move on. Don't let anyone get in your way. That's how we think a lot of times. And, and we, 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 we don't stop to look at the people around us. We don't stop to notice that person in the grocery store. We don't stop to notice the need of the cashier. We don't stop to notice that, that person who brushes by us. And, 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 and we don't think about the condition of their heart. But I'd like to challenge you this morning, just like Jesus Christ said to his disciples, look up and see the fields. They're white. They're ready to be harvested. All we have to do is to open our eyes and pay attention and to do something about it. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for today and for your blessings, Father. I thank you for your word and for how it teaches us and instructs us, how it encourages us. Lord, what a powerful message here. What an amazing story of how you made a difference in the life of this woman at the well. But also, Lord, a, 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 a sobering challenge that, that you brought to your disciples, that you bring to us this morning. Help us not to be so caught up in ourselves and our needs and our wants and our desires that we miss out on the ultimate need of the souls of mankind, Father. I pray, Father, that you, would, that you would work in our hearts, that we would be willing to make a difference, Father, that we would be missionaries, not just in a foreign land, but that we would be missionaries where we are now, that we would look up and we would see the needs around us, that we would have a part in your work, Father. We love you. Thank you so much for loving us, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Amen. When I uh, look up, I see you. I see your children, your children in our Sunday school classes, children at Mid-State Christian Academy, the next generation. That's what I see when I look up. And I think that a lot of us, probably the same thing. We look up, we see our spouses, we see our children, we see each other, and that's a good thing. But it's a better thing to not stop there. We need to look up and not just see each other, although that's important. We need to look out for each other. God's word says as Christians we have to encourage and exhort one another. But folks, for a Christian, it cannot end with just our church. For a Christian, we have to, as a church, look up and look outside of our church.